You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY Musician Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 125 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin, and joining me for this roundtable edition is Chris and the Bolt. Hello there. In the flesh. In the flesh. All three of us back together. That's right. In one place. In one Portland. In one Portland. Portland. That's right. And I have yet to see the sun since I've been here. It's starting to peek out. It's going to get hot. Yeah. You know, it's going to be 90 all next week. Well, I'm not going to be here next week, so. (laughs) Well, you know, that's what we like to do, scare everybody away (laughs) with the rain and then then have some nice weather. Um, So, how you guys been? Everything good? Yeah, good, good. I just played a show last weekend, um, which was uh, sort of an anomaly. We didn't know we were playing it until a couple of days before, but uh, it went well. Good, which is interesting because we're going to be talking about playing shows today. Exactly. So, exactly. And how pe- and people's strategies behind how they get paid and all that. Apparently, yours is to just wait till they drop from the sky. Right, <laughs> right. There was no planning involved, and uh, yeah, we got paid in drink tickets. But we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I also played a show last week, and uh, this will hopefully factor into our discussion as well. The, the, the guy who owns the, the, the joint, the whatever you'd call it, the restaurant, Came up and he said, "You know, I've owned this place for twenty years, and I I never make money. This uh, it's just a labor of love. I've never made a dime off this place. I opened this place for you." <laughs> oh. He pointed at me, and I was like, "I think that's a compliment." And then he said he loved the music. So, oh, I didn't know if that you were supposed to laugh or cry or give him a hug or what. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, yeah, we'll be talking uh, a lot. Later on in the podcast about that, about uh, how people are making money from their live shows. And lots of uh, people weighed in on our CD Baby Facebook page when we posed the question. So you'll want to hear what people had to say. Um, as, as a reminder, we want to hear from you. Our listener line is 360-524-2209. If something we talk about on the podcast strikes a chord with you or gets you fired up we want you to call leave a message try to keep it between one and two minutes in length and uh, we'll try and get on the podcast with uh, your feedback you can it could just be a shout out it could be a question a comment whatever song? you want to write a theme song if for you one want of us? to call and sing a song and i believe that has happened in the mm-hmm. past but uh um yeah do it and you can also email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com so Check it out there. All right. We're going to get into some news. The discussion about Pandora and the royalty rates they pay for the music used in their service continues to rage. It might have reached its fever pitch recently when Pandora bought a small radio station in South Dakota. Industry analysts stated that it was a way for them to find a loophole in the law that will allow them to reduce royalty rates. Others thought it was a publicity stunt in order to shine a light on the fact of how messed up the system is. Since the radio station purchase, there have been, there's been so much discussion and new developments about Pandora that I think we're going to have to have a special Pandora-focused podcast to discuss it all. There's just too much information mentioned in the news the past couple weeks to cover it all here, so I think that's what we're going to do. There might still be time to go huge in Japan. The music industry sales numbers are showing that Japan is poised to take the lead as the largest music market in the world. The largest meaning the country generating the most revenue from music. In 2012, they were number two behind the U.S., but while sales in the U.S. were pretty much flat, Japan's sales were up 4%. Some credit the strong preference for the CD format, which has seen a resurgence in Japan, while others credit the strict anti-piracy laws that have been passed recently. Others point out that the success in in Japan is based mainly on the notion of a music idol. Basically, the success is driven by artists who are created by major labels to achieve pop icon status as opposed to a thriving musician middle class. Anyway, there's still lots going on in Japan, apparently. Finally, Amazon has released its first Cities That Rock list, where it lists the top 20 cities in the U.S. that buy the most MP3, CDs, and vinyl per capita from Amazon. Some surprising people on the list. I'm going to read the list here so we can all right. ooh and ah. Number one, Miami, Florida. Number two, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Three, Orlando, Florida. Four, Salt Lake City, Utah. Five, St. Louis, Missouri. Six, Cincinnati, Ohio. Seven, Seattle, Washington. 
8, Ann Arbor, Michigan, 9, Richmond, Virginia, 11, 10 got cut off. We're going to have to find out what number 10 was. Mystery <laughs> challenge. <laughs> We're going to keep moving on. 10 wasn't important. 11 is Cambridge, Massachusetts, 12, Columbia, South Carolina, 13, Knoxville, Tennessee, 14, Dayton, Ohio, 15, Rochester, New York, 16, Berkeley, California, 17, Vancouver, Washington, my hometown, I should say, 18, Alexandria, Virginia, 19, Portland, Oregon, and number 20 is Bellevue, Washington. Oh, there's number 10. It was on the next page. It's Atlanta, Georgia. So, so um, some interesting finds. Seattle bought the most indie music. Rock music reigns in Pittsburgh. Cambridge is a classical town. And Orlando is a leader in pop music. Wow. Very interesting. Good Good Disney. Figure. Yeah. But that, I thought that... Uh, that list was very interesting. One, because, you know... Your suburb? M- yeah. Vancouver, Washington is basically a town across the river from Portland, Oregon. So I always look at these things, and I usually am happy to see Portland represented because, you know, we're all in the same general location. We use the same stores. We drive on the same freeways. <laughs> but uh, when I saw Vancouver, Washington outpace Portland for a per capita of people buying music... Had a little hometown proud pride there, so <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was interesting. Northwest represented well. Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, Pittsburgh. What was that number two? That was number two yeah, outside of Miami. Pittsburgh. Miami surprised me. I did not expect Miami to be they need buying a lot of hot music. club music to uh, drive yeah, their sensual they, lives. They, they did say that dance music was very popular in Miami, but the surprising thing on Miami was also uh, kids music. Hmm. Very weird. Interesting. So, yeah. Interesting to, to see the, the areas of the country that are buying the most music from Amazon. And, and you know, I, it would be nice to compare against, like, iTunes or even, you know, pulling hard sales from places like Walmart and music retailers that still exist out there. So, mm. but, uh, yeah. Um. So Japan, you going to be moving to Japan soon, Chris? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I just have to. Um, what do I have to do first? I have to lose a lot of weight. What does that have to do with it? I have to learn Japanese. Ah. If I want to be a pop icon, oh, I, you know, beer bellies don't cut it in Japan. I don't think. I don't know. You might be able to pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> They're just fascinated with Americans. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. We do have a, uh, a listener of the podcast. His name's Kelly, who is an artist in Japan, oh. and he always he weighs in every once in a while, like on the blog or on Twitter, and talking about the scene in Japan. He, I mentioned, I posted this article on Twitter, and he mentioned that he wished it was less about the business and there was actually some talent there. So I think he was referring to the aspect of it being generating a lot of pop icons, but not a lot of artistry going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Lots of auto tune. Yeah, those kind of things. So, um, the Pandora issue, uh, I don't want to get into it too much today because since this happened where they bought the radio station, there has been so many developments. Um, uh, one of them being an artist showing a picture of one of their royalty statements saying they got paid 16 bucks for a million plays. Um, one being a blog post, like official statement from uh, Tim, Tim Westergren of Pandora, uh, trying to clear the air about a lot of misconceptions that are out there. Another being Pandora asking artists to sign a petition. And then the last thing was, uh, somebody did a response to, uh, David Lowry. He's the artist who posted the royalty statement, a response to him saying that his numbers were really off and he was only, uh, showing a piece of the pie and skewing the whole argument and gave a, a whole breakdown of what they thought would be the real, the real deal. And so lots of stuff to talk about Pandora. So I thought it'd be cool if we do in, a, in the next couple of weeks an episode where we just discuss Pandora. And if you've got comments about your thoughts on the Pandora issue, the streaming uh, rates people pay, uh, we didn't mention in the news, but iTunes officially announced iTunes radio. And there's a lot of question about the rates they'll pay. So is this good for the industry, bad for the industry? We'd love to hear your comments. Call in. And we'll have a whole Pandora throwdown. So you've become more of a Pandora devotee in the past. I I, they, few I weeks. think they've converted me. I think they've converted me. It, I, I'll save it for the Pandora episode because 
there was a string of events that happened that that started changing my line of thinking. I never thought it was bad. I was just kind of indifferent to it. But um, yeah, so that little teaser. People will be on the edge of their seat. What <laughs> happened to Kevin for him to like Pandora? <laughs> yeah. It's like a conversion story. I know. <laughs> so You just right. like Pandora now that you got music on there. Well, it's been on there. That's what... Well, sh- 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 well, okay. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it next podcast. Yes, next podcast. So, um, All right. So today we are going to be discussing how people are getting paid for their live shows and the strategies behind that or the types of shows they're getting that are actually paying and the types that they're getting that aren't paying it. And well, we were talking and somehow this came up. Well, what were we talking about? Well, I was just thinking because we had had this, um, we just played this show and um, we were given drink tickets for the show and it was a last minute show and there were five bands in sort of a divey bar. I mean, a lot of people showed up and we probably spent, you know, there's probably a good amount of money to spend on drinks. Now, I don't know um, if there was any money paid up by the bar or not. Honestly, we did not expect. We were the first band. We were happy to get drink tickets, and that was it. Some artists might say we're stupid for not at least inquiring about a little money, but we, um, we haven't been playing a lot of shows lately, and we were just happy to play a show, and we're happy for the drink tickets. And um, I know that that uh, some artists believe that, you know, that bands shouldn't do that, shouldn't do what we did. They shouldn't, you know, that they should demand to, you know, make some cut of the um, bar sales or something like that. I don't think there was a door, so it would have been just bar sales. But I think that that being div- divided up between, like, five bands would have been nothing anyway. So Yeah. Yeah, so we started getting, started talking about shows that pay, how people are getting paid, What's working, what's not. And uh, Chris, I think you had some insights on this. Or what, 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 what's, what have you been experiencing uh, well, out there I, lately? I have a lot to say about The first thing I was thinking was that, and I probably made this point on previous episodes, but for, you know, a decade or so, I was playing in bands and bringing lots of gear to shows, and you show up at 5 o'clock and you sound check, and then you wait around and you go on at 10 or 11, and then, you know, you're kind of got a buzz and you've, drank irresponsibly and then it's, oh i thought you were saying you built a buzz like the people were excited about oh you. well you know ho- hopefully that was happening too but um and then it's 3 a.m and you're home and you're exhausted and you have you know 200 bucks for it or whatever you know mm-hmm. some some amount of money that you need to split amongst all your band members for eight or nine hours of work um then more so in the past few years for me i've been doing a lot of just solo acoustic singer songwriter kind of shows, and it, I have a, f- a way easier time finding gigs that pay. They give me a guarantee. They feed me. Maybe they give me a couple drink tickets. The audiences are more receptive, so I sell more merch. Even if the crowd is smaller, you know, I, c- I could play a place that accommodates thirty people and sell way more CDs than I would have at a, a three hundred capacity rock club. Um, so for me, and then you know. You show up and you play for two hours and you go home. There's no waiting around. So you're saying that it's just the days of being in a rock band are over? (laughs) It's a lot more economical. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I've gotten to a place where I have less time to sort of invest that energy into just sitting and waiting around in order to not make money. So where I'm at in my life, it just makes more sense. Um, You know, I still miss having harmonies and having people to play with, but like I I can do that once in a while, but... In terms of weekly gigs or whatever, it just makes more sense. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the kinds of gigs we've had where either it was a good payday or not a good payday and the benefits of either. You know, Bolton just mentioned, uh, you know, the the scenario that came up for him recently. And when we were talking about this topic, I was kind of thinking, you know, most of the gigs that we had with Hello Morning here in Portland fell into two camps. There was one gig where we got paid a lot of money, but there, it was not a fan building gig at all. And then there was the gigs that were the pay might have been questionable, but the ability to build a fan base for our music was definitely an opportunity that night. 
Um, and it, it just kind of looking at how those weighing whether or not the money is worth it or how much you weigh those two against each other, I think is an interesting discussion because I know a lot of artists struggle with that. Well, I, I'm not sure if you'd look at a college gig. I mean, that's kind of maybe in between. But yeah. from in my experience, the college gigs paid a lot of money, but you might be playing in the student union at, at one o'clock in the afternoon while people are basically sitting there reading. So it wasn't always like a huge fan building, but you get paid a lot. Mm -hmm. But also maybe that's in between because you can make some fans. But um, we always used to try and think about like on a tour, if we played for two weeks, getting like one or two of those spaced throughout the tour to, to offset, you know, money concerns, but but mostly trying to focus on the, the gigs that paid less, but you could build your fan base. And I have noticed the um, on some of the short tours that I've done that a lot of times people will, especially people that book the shows or the other bands, will make sure that the touring band gets paid. And I've done that myself. Our band, if we play with the touring band, we'll usually give up our portion of the money for the touring band because you know it costs money to tour. And uh, so you'll probably find that you get paid better when you're on tour, um, but maybe not always. Yeah, I've actually had that come up with uh, a couple gigs here in town where there was uh, like a three band bill. One of the, two of the bands being local, one band being from out of town, and them saying, "Hey guys, can we? You know, this band's a touring band. Can we give them two hundred bucks and, right. and just give you guys X amount?" Um, yeah. You know, at that point, I'm like, "Whatever." Yeah. <laughs> For the per, you know, you're gonna lose fifty bucks, but yeah. it can seem like a yeah. It's kind of like, do I want to be a jerk or? <laughs> You know, when it comes down to it, be out ten dollars because there's five people in the band. Right, you know? exactly. So. <laughs> well, I mean, and you hope people will do the same thing for you when you're on tour. Yeah. Is like because you want to support the community and you want to, you want it, you want the possibility of bands going on tour without going broke to be a possibility. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Well, and I think you know if you're looking to make just make money from touring, I think you're going to have to start looking outside of just the typical club gig for, you know, just playing the clubs up and down the coast or across the country isn't probably going to cut it, you know, and judging from, this is a major pain point for artists, judging from the response we got huh. from uh, artists on our Facebook page, uh, which we will get to shortly. But uh, one thing I was noticing that, you know, with Hello Morning, one of the biggest paying gigs we ever got it was a thousand dollars to play this oyster fest that this restaurant this irish pub was putting on in downtown portland um they paid us i was a little worried because they started promoting it the two days before day before <laughs> <laughs> it was total last minute it was their second year trying to do it and they just like last minute decided to do it so everything was done well lights sound um, they paid us, and we literally played our set while people were tearing stuff down. I mean, there was nobody there. And that's why I was worried they weren't going to pay us, but they still paid us. And then we had another gig that was put on by one of the cities, uh, like one of the towns outside of Portland. Same type of thing, done perfectly well. They just didn't know how to promote a concert. Nobody was there, and we got paid a lot of money. And it was just... It's interesting when you start looking at it that way. Am I out here to try and make money? Which those gigs were great. They helped us put money towards the next records. But at the same time, what's important to me is making sure that people are hearing our music and liking it. And, you know, they, it's like a trade off. You know, the, a lot of people just fall down the line of saying, artists must get paid, period. Which, you know, if there's money and that night that someone's making and the artist isn't getting a cut, that's that's a shame. The artist should get a cut. But if it's the idea of just choosing, am I going to get my music in front of an audience who might become fans, buy my music, buy T-shirts, tell their friends, and help me grow an audience, or just get two hundred bucks? I mean, you know, to me, I'd rather get in front of people. Well, it's interesting to think that you know someone that's putting on a festival, festival, a street fair, a you know, a city event, carnival, whatever, that these people are like. I mean, they think to themselves, oh, we need some entertainment. We need some bands. They're not thinking like, oh, we can get some great bands for 200 bucks each. You know, like yeah. they're thinking like real, like actually paying, you know, some real money for this entertainment. And it, in a way, it's kind of strange that, that um, clubs and um, bars and stuff like that are like, oh, we can get like five bands to play here for free and just give yeah. them some drink tickets. Yeah. 
but um but yeah i think that that's just there are so many bands that are willing to pay for free and well, I think there's a strategy between the two as well. Like you mentioned, those kind of organizations, and I would throw into that mix uh, government organizations, corporate events, anybody who School, has a churches, yep, yeah, anybody who has a budget that they have to spend. The person who's booking the bands does not know the ins and outs of booking a band. Does not go to the local clubs and talk to the club bookers. How much are you paying bands? They just know they have X amount to pull off the event and. They want something good. And that Oyster Fest I mentioned, that's what happened to us. Somebody from one of the local radio stations was at a previous show of ours, liked us a lot, and recommended us to this person. They didn't try to negotiate. They didn't say, well, how many people you draw in Portland or, uh, you know, what's how much have you sold? They just said, we've got a thousand bucks, you know. And it's like the funny thing was going to the local club uh, here in Portland that we liked playing, the Doug Fur. Uh, getting a thousand bucks, it'd be like, you better pack this place out, you know, getting a guarantee and from probably them. Probably that'd be like your third time packing that place. Yeah. Out yeah. Before and, you could really... Yeah. And so it's a different, totally different scenario. And so I think you got to keep those things in mind and not just assume that you're not going to get anything, but also understand who you're dealing with, who, what their motivations are and, and what kind of financial situation they're working with. You know, if it's somebody with a budget, don't go in there with, uh, don't lowball, you know, let them uh, let, them, let uh, them reveal what their budget will <laughs> allow, and then you can say yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I had a thought about your gig at the oyster thing in in, in the town uh, square, or whatever, that were not well attended. You're making a lot of money that you can put towards your recordings, but it's also not a total waste opportunity if you have someone there that can like get real close to the stage and video you on on a great stage with oh, yeah. lights and all that stuff. Just make sure they don't pan the camera out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah to the left Believe right. me, I, I, uh, <laughs> both, well, not the, not the Oyster Fest, because that one was late at night, but the other one, it was the, the one that was in the town square, and it was an impressive looking stage. It looked like a big festival stage. And so I had strict instructions. I'm like, I want some close-ups. I want you to be able to see it's a big stage. Because it's, those are the kind of things that you got to take opportunities to, you know, Put pictures on your website. I included some video in one of our videos that makes it look like we're playing in an impressive yeah. event. And then uh, um, you just you cut off playing. the end where the person pans away <laughs> and there's nobody but your wife standing there. <laughs> you were playing at an impressive event. Just no yeah. one was there to see it. Yeah, that, that it was so impressive, you know. <laughs> now, have you guys, are, are there, you know, have you ever run into any clubs or, or bars where they're just like we don't pay the bands yes and yeah i've i've seen that as well and and what do you how do you feel about that it depends on their attitude and how they accommodate you like so there's one club that i've been playing a lot in portland maine that's um a good list it's a small club it's a good listening room they don't pay but they do a great job of um making the artist feel welcome and then during your set um, several times they'll make a point of telling everyone in the place, you know, tip. So they pass the tip around, they make some announcements from the stage. They're like, if, if you don't have cash to tip the, the, um, the artist, they'll charge it on your card and then pay you out of the bar at the end of the night. So I've done really well. I've made hundreds of dollars there just on tips, but so that's fine. I'm like getting right. paid. Yeah. Right. But, um, I've had other opposite experiences yeah. that are terrible. Where I mean, like, yeah. I mean, my feeling is is this, and and maybe these are some some key like strategy points to consider, and then we can get into some of the listener feedback and people posting on our uh, Facebook page. Um, one, it could be if if you're not getting paid, it could be a good opportunity just to be, you know, a live rehearsal in the sense that. Getting used to a lot of bands will practice in their rehearsal space. They know the sound, they get used to it, and then they go into a live setting where the sound system's totally different and it's awkward because it's a small stage or it's a different setup and they just fall apart. And just getting some experience with that. If you're a seasoned musician, you're like, screw that, I don't need that, then some other strategies could be that, you know, seeing what the place is and what kind of is it a place as a, a good reputation and um, people recognize that venue as having good music. Well, it might be worth playing a couple shows there just to be able to have photos of you playing there, get some good shots uh, that you can put on your website. 
um, that prove that you are a uh, a musician that's out there playing, you know, in the scene. That's that's somebody that's you know got a following, um, and then you know maybe beyond that, artists just don't ask. You know, they yeah. just assume they're not going to get paid, yeah. and don't educate the owner because. Uh, I would assume that a lot of the people that were weighing in saying they don't get paid, it sounded like some of them, the comments they were saying, like they might live in a small town. And, you know, maybe you got to do some education with the bar owner. Say, look, we will bring in X amount of people, but I need this in order to make right. it happen. And mm-hmm. and educating them, they're just assuming that you're going to show up and just be background music. Of course, they're not going to be wanting to pay if it's not like a music venue. But, you know, think about that. Get to know the people and then, uh, you know, definitely, you know, like the, the, some of the gigs we had where we got paid well and nobody was there seeing so, you know, how you can make use of that situation where, yeah, we got paid, but, uh, you know, it doesn't feel that great to be playing with everyone packing up. <laughs> All yeah. you see is people packing up, but, you know, think, okay, is there a way I can capture this? This is a nice stage. Capture it where it's going to look good on our website. Use this opportunity, you know, have a little more fun. Try something new on stage where it's low risk. And really start looking at uh, what I can do to, to change the situation. Because at the end of the day, you you are your own product. And if uh, you are interesting, entertaining, good, uh, have a, a great performance, a good show, things will happen for you. If you just kind of go through there and run down a set list, go through the motions and have a sour face because you don't like the situation. Well, you're not doing anything to help improve it. So yeah. Um, yeah. that's what I have to say. One thing I was thinking of is it's probably worth noting that there's not just one type of musician either. I think a lot of our conversation now is maybe based around the idea that you're building towards having a full-time music career within a, mm-hmm. a certain kind of pop, rock, folk, like a club. Yeah, so, and yeah. There are some people that there, there are lots of people that are jazz pianists or, or classical violinists or, or whatever that they're working musicians that need to play every night and they need to get paid in order yeah. to make it worth their effort. Um, it's harder to, to, yeah, much harder to justify saying, oh, just play for free. You know what's interesting about uh, Portland showing up on the list of top 20 cities that um, people buy in music? Uh, our airport always has independent artists performing in there around the airport yeah. with their CDs for sale. Uh-huh. It's, it's just very interesting that, you know, maybe there's things that are just naturally happening in our town culturally that kind of bring more awareness to music and buying music. I don't know. Well, it's just, the ma- the mayor is always um, going to music events and, and having bands play it kind of official government. Yeah. And the funny thing is functions. I travel enough for CD baby that I'll be like at the airport and like, Oh, he's here. He's good. And just kind of sit down and listen <laughs> for a bit. <laughs> there's several reoccurring guys that I see there all the time mm-hmm. there. And it's not just, there'll be a pianist. There's a guy that does this really cool looping with a violin. Oh, I've seen him. He's good. Yeah. yeah see, he's, he's getting a name for himself at the airport. I, I think, I think another, um, strategy for, for making more money. Um, and the reason why I'm thinking this is because, a number of years ago, I um, went down to California to tour with my band, and we played um, this little town, Merced, and they did basically had almost no opportunity to see live music in that town. Like they didn't have any venues, they didn't have anyone organizing shows, and so this one guy basically started organizing shows at just various random places. I think we played in front of a pizza shop, um, in like a basically like in a um, mini mall. And but people came out of the woodwork to see us who had never ever heard of us, and we sold like every piece of merch we had, and I, the people were so grateful to see music, and they were so much wanted us to come back. Like they were telling us, like, when are you coming back? Like you know, mm-hmm. and they love. I mean, we sold out all our T-shirts. We sold like more CDs than we'd ever sold before, and it was people who had never heard of us before. Yeah, I had that same experience experience or similar experience in Modesto that was always our favorite place to play on tour because it seemed like you were dealing with an enthusiastic young audience instead of you know jaded San Francisco or LA people and um, I went to go see a friend of mine Trevor who used to work at CD Baby play the other night and he lives in West Texas and he tours a lot he makes all his money off of music he won't play in cities he like well Portland obviously is an exception because he had a really nice setup but 
Uh, generally, it's just small towns because you can have better relationships with the bar owners. People are yeah. more appreciative. You sell CDs. Yep. 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 Well, let's get <laughs> into I, some feedback. Oh, sorry. Oh, go no, go ahead. Did you have a thought? Oh, it was just I I, I know a guy. Uh, um, I think it was uh, that guy, Little Wings. Um He's, uh, I think, a K Records musician. Anyway, he would go on just small town tours um, where he just would skip all the cities. Yeah. Small town people need music, too. Exactly. Let's get into some of the, the comments we got off our Facebook page. It was quite a variety. Is it a bloodbath? Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't as bad. It, it made me sad for some folks. <laughs> but... Uh, um, let's just go down the list. Uh, Eric Johnson said, and it's not Eric Johnson, the guitar player. This guy, this Eric Johnson may play guitar, but not the he doesn't Eric play Johnson. Cliffs of Dover. No. Making money. Ha, huh? not around here. Musicians are expected to sing for their dinner. Monte Michel Blue. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right. The worth of musicians has been completely devalued. It's sad and pathetic. I'm making the same or less than when I started out 30 plus years ago. Hillary Fox song. Wow, judging by these comments. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> wow, judging by these comments, my band's doing pretty darn well. <laughs> Edward Garcia. To me, it's more for the enjoyment and the love for music, and that's priceless. Chris Parker. This year I've averaged $85 per show, while last year I averaged $43. I play between 40 and 50 shows a year, and most money comes via tips. Chip Gilchrist, wow, you guys make me feel pretty fortunate to come home with eighty to hundred dollars each gig. Smiling Bob Lewis, I've been playing in clubs for over fifty years. I'm in the hole. People and club owners think we do, we just do this for fun. Three wives later, it's kind of fun. What happened to patrons of the arts? <laughs> I don't even, I'm not sure, quite sure what he meant. If he's looking for, <laughs> we'll just move on. <laughs> Dean High depends on how much they throw into the guitar case. Charles, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Sokolek. Money, not here in Honolulu. And uh, this was an exchange I had with uh, Nathan Leinard, I think his name was. Uh, his last name, how you pronounce it? Um, he started off saying he, he makes about 150 to 200 plus a tab in tips here in Southeast Virginia. And so I started asking him some more questions. I went back and was asking a lot of these folks for more details, but some of them didn't see it in time for us to record this. Um, and I, so I asked him where he was and what kind of places he was playing. He said, I'm in the Hampton Roads area, primar primarily playing specifically in Williamsburg. They are simple bar, restaurants, and pretty exclusive resort country club. The number of people can vary from 20 to 30 to around 50 to 60. I play every Friday night at the country club and every other Wednesday at a specific bar. Then throughout the month, I will play certain places once or twice a month. In June, he had about 12, 10 to 12 shows. So then I was asking him, I wanted to find out, you know, with those guarantees, was he getting tips, you know? Because the country club, that was one where I thought, well, maybe he found a gig where, hey, that's a place that was more than happy to pay somebody 200 bucks to play guitar or whatever. So, um he, he said he could send a list of the places. He posted the list on, uh, on Facebook, if anyone's interested in checking out on our Facebook page. Um, so I asked him, are the country clubs and bars paying around 150 to 200 guarantee? Is it original music? And he said it's guaranteed, usually with a tab for a meal and a couple of beers, probably a 70-30 split between cover and original. I'll play for three hours and at least play 10 original tunes a show. If the crowd is really digging the original tunes, I'll play more. Those are so, the kinds of gigs I was, I've been doing more of. Yeah, so the hour shows. It was an interesting mix. It, it there was a lot more doom and gloom that I didn't read. People that just seemed very frustrated. The sense I got from reading them was a lot of those folks were in uh, smaller towns, maybe that where there wasn't a scene, wasn't professional venues for you know they're just like local bars where people play so that was the sense i got could be wrong and plus i don't know the kind of music any of these folks play so right and that all definitely depend i mean the guy who says you know like getting paid in honolulu um for music now we know because hawaii is a big vacation spot that um there's a lot of people paying money for entertainment and music and stuff in honolulu it just may not be where he's plugged of, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I will say, having having been to to Hawaii, 
uh, the past year. It is a weird place when it comes to music. If you listen to the radio there, there's not like the pop station, the rock station. You'll be listening to the radio and be like some like Hawaiian music. Then it'll be a Lady Gaga song. Then it'll be some other weird track. It's just all over the map, like heavy metal song. It was, just, And it's not necessarily, it was just weird. And so I started asking a lot of the locals about it. And, um, you know, you see, you know, some people catering to the tourists. Um, I know Jack Johnson plays there all the time and like packs the place out. And so there's certain <laughs> artists that, cause I was, you know, I was just fascinated by it when I was there, I was asking a lot of people and there was certain artists that tend to do like the Jack Johnson style that come out and do pretty well. And they had just started really, um, getting bigger bands again. I know the shins had, I think just played there like a month before. I, and so they were starting to get tours going there. It's really expensive to go there. I mean, you got to get all your gear on a plane or a boat and it's not cheap right. yeah. and uh, you're only going to be able to play really one major city. So yeah, that's um, why they've got it figured out. They just have those ukuleles and yeah. Just... But the thing was, you know, when I was walking down the street uh, in Waikiki, there was this four piece of, you know, like they look like early 20 year old guys that were dressed like, um, kind of like, I don't know. They, they had like a vest. They kind of look New Yorky, New Yorkish, type guys that didn't look Hawaiian at all, you know, as far as like their, the way they were dressed. And one had an accordion, one had a guitar and like a, a fiddle. And I thought, interesting. I wonder how it's going for these guys. Cause it's, you know, it was original music and they were just busking on the street. I'm like, Hmm, hmm. just seems like a weird spot for that vibe, but you never know. <laughs> then there was the guy dressed up as Santa Claus playing <laughs> Christmas songs what in the middle of May. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, you know, it takes all types in Hawaii. So anyway, if you have comments about that, we would love to hear your feedback about how you're getting, what you're getting paid for gigs, what the kind of gigs they are, what you're doing to make money. Um, you can call us at our listener line at 360-524-2209. If you just want to cry on our shoulders, give us some strategies that are working, um, you know, Give some ideas on to the artist community that seem to be pretty frustrated about getting paid for shows. Definitely two camps that kind of weighed in there. People that were making an average of, you know, 100 bucks a night or people that just felt hopeless. You don't think, I don't know if uh, this is a whole other episode in and of itself, but we didn't talk much about the actual nitty gritty details of negotiating your pay or uh, looking at the rider and the expenses that the clubs are claiming that they're taking out of your cut for the night. A lot yeah. of that is just BS. Yeah. I had uh, a sheet that one of the clubs here in Portland gave me when we were settling up. Um, and uh, it had all these line items. They didn't use them all, but just the fact that they had this sheet with like 20 line items where they could add expenses was a bit startling. Some of them were just, you know, out of control. Like four hundred dollars to promote your show alone. I'm like, you didn't spend that much on this show. To you promote. paid five bucks to get a poster that had twenty shows on it, right? Printed at twenty shows, <laughs> and then you took out an ad for the next month's worth of shows in the local weekly. And yeah, well, I think we're all talking about the same. No, I, I'm clubs. talking about one that's not even in business anymore. <laughs> I know which one you're talking about, but yeah, it, it would be interesting to find out what artists are seeing in that aspect as well, because, you know, there is, I think, the typical bar club owner that doesn't know much about music that just will get anyone in there to play and will, you know, drink tickets for free or let them give them 50 bucks or whatever. But then there's the more professional club and just how, you know. How, how you're getting screwed by both of those variety of clubs. <laughs> I have one horror story I want to share. All right, we all right then we'll close it out. So I played a, a, a club on tour. It was outside of Sacramento, California, and the payment was drink tickets. We were going on last. I, no, we, anyways, it was late. It was either midnight or 1 p.m., uh, 1 a.m. when we were supposed to go on. So we get set up, we, or we bring our uh, gear in and we're like okay can we have the drink tickets he s says oh no no you don't get those until you go on what like are you serious he's like well i'm afraid if i give bands drink tickets before they play they'll just drink and then leave <laughs> <laughs> so it's that bad <laughs> we went downstairs and we had like a little band meeting we we're like should we just get the hell out of here now um because that's just insulting 
And yeah. uh, if that's a common problem he's having, then clearly there's the problem is him. Yeah. So, anyways, we're like, well, we're here. We'll just play. So we stayed around. It was like 1 a.m. and the mic stands were breaking, and I it was, it was terrible, basically yeah. speaking. But then after we played, we got the drink tickets. And guess what time it was? 2 a.m. Last call. <laughs> 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 so we didn't even get to use them. Oh, oh man. So that's his plan. <laughs> yeah, there, there also, I think, could be a podcast about, you know, musician etiquette. You know, as far as if, if he's concerned, it could have been him that the, the gig sucks and bands are showing up drinking and leaving. Or it could be that, uh, you know, he's been burned a bunch by just goofballs. Yeah. Ruin it for the rest of us. So... All right. Well, if you've got comments, we want to hear them. I know this is a topic people like to to weigh in on and that have good stories and, and insights to share. Again, 360-524-2209, podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. Can't believe we went this whole episode without mentioning fun units. Oh, fun <laughs> units, yes. Uh, do, do we have someone more online where we've mentioned that? Yeah, we talked about that. We, we talked about this in the past. We talked about getting paid in fun units. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which are abbreviated F-U's. as FUs. <laughs> I, I get paid in FUs. <laughs> I think we need so, to credit Rachel Taylor Brown. That yeah, was, we I, do. I believe that was her coinage. Hey, it, it, it speaks to all of us. It does. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tell I, us how many fun units you make. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, well, we'll catch you next time. And uh, please call, and we'll discuss more. That was kind of a sorry ending. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a ring, and we'll be back. All right. Peace <laughs> out. <laughs> See ya. Bye. <laughs>been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA.